Welcome to the United States Social Work Context Lecture. I'm Dr. Christina Nakalova, and I'm an assistant professor at Wayne State University. I do just have to say up front, though, that I am not actually an American. I'm a Canadian citizen, and I was originally born in Bulgaria, a little country in Eastern Europe. So I come um, at uh, this from a very international perspective. So the United States of America is actually made up of 51, not very United States, the district capital, plus three territories, which aren't even counted as uh, states and don't have the same rights. You can see from this picture that politically they're all very different. Uh, the blue represents democratic states, which are on the liberal end, uh, and the red represents the Republican states, which are more on the conservative end of the scale. But what you have to understand is that within the United States, even the Democratic Party, which is supposed to be the more liberal party, um, if we were to compare it to, say, a European party, it would actually end up somewhere on the uh, right or conservative side of the scale. So this is a very... Um, particular context where the country is as much divided as it is united when it comes to social politics. So the reason I'm going to go through uh, a brief history of the U.S. Uh, social work context is because history never says goodbye. It only says see you later and is in danger of repeating unless we're not careful. So within the U.S. there is a very long history of colonialism and I can only just barely touch on everything in this lecture. Uh, we could spend weeks talking about all of the ways that um, early settlers and even current policies continue to marginalize certain groups of people. So it all began with the purposeful extermination of First Nations tribes through the purposeful spreading of disease, incarceration in work camps, the forced displacement, um, such as the Trail of Tears, where um, hundreds of uh, individuals were forced to walk a thousand miles and during that time uh, a lot of people did not make the trip and then as well there were a lot of genocidal war tactics purposefully aimed at um, obliterating the first nations tribes at the same time we've got the enslavement of black people which continued until the american civil war however even after the civil war freed all black slaves there were what were known as Jim Crow laws implemented in the south of the U.S. And what these laws did was basically continue the segregation of black and white individuals so that black individuals were still second class citizens. They weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to access the same services as white individuals. They weren't allowed to work in the same places or even um, ride the same buses or go to the same restaurants. It basically continued uh, slavery until the 1960s civil rights movement. Of course, at that time, it was replaced by the prison industrial complex, which has resulted in basically um, one in 10 American adults being uh, in prison at the moment in the country, which is a huge uh, number if you think about it. We also have very high rates of immigration from Europe and East Asia during the Industrial Revolution. Um, however, how these immigrants were treated was very different. Chinese and East Indian, East Asian immigrants, sorry, um, were denied citizenship for a very long time, even though they were purposefully brought over into the U.S. to help build the rail system, and hundreds of them died during this very unsafe um, time. And other um, undesirable immigrants had their children removed, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Also, um, continuing to this day, America has no universal health care, and medication costs are decided by companies, not government. So basically, a lot of the social services in the U.S. are privatized and determined by neoliberal policies. 
everything from uh, even foster care is determined by private corporations, which are um, often for profit, not public agencies the way they are in most countries. All right, let's go back quickly to um, some of that immigration that I mentioned. We had a huge influx of immigrants coming uh, in the 1800s through the early 1900s, most of them settling in the eastern United States. So think New York City, Boston, um, New Jersey, that area. And when you have a large group of people coming in like that, there's very often not enough resources to house them or feed them. So they end up in what were known as tenement houses. So multiple families crammed into tiny little um, apartments that were completely unsafe. There were several tragedy, tragedies where an entire um, apartment buildings went up in flames and hundreds of people lost their lives. There were no labor protections um, for them and they often lived in extreme poverty. The early social workers at the time were very concerned about the children of these families, so they decided that the best route would be to take them away from their parents and place them in um, what were known as asylums or orphanages. So this picture here very much looks like it could have been taken um, at a Nazi concentration camp, but no, this is one of those orphanages uh, in Pittsburgh in the 1880s. You can see the children are unclean, thin, shaved because of lice, all wearing the exact same um, clothes, and not a single child is smiling. Um, in this picture. These were not very safe places for children. Uh, here's another image, this little girl, you can see the dress is dirty, she's thin, she has no shoes. Um, and these asylums were often run by uh, church organizations because um, at the time, as now, the state government is very much unwilling to step in and interfere with family rights or individual rights. Once it became clear that these uh, orphanages were not working and were actually placing children at increased risk of harm, the social workers at the time decided the next best solution would be what were known as the orphan trains. What ended up happening is they would take all of these children and ship them west where the country um, was still developing. There weren't very many cities set up. It was mainly farmland. The problem, as you can imagine, is that there wasn't a lot of screening as to who got these children. And as I mentioned, many of these children weren't actually orphans. They were just taken from their parents because it was judged that the parents couldn't care for them because they were too poor. So the solution wasn't to you know, help the parents get out of poverty. No, the parents were put into um, almshouses where they were forced to work and the children were taken and shipped west through these orphan trains. Some 200,000 children were shipped west um, up, right up until 1929. And here are some images of these orphan trains um, shipped with very little supervision to um, become basically farm hands. Uh, in farms on the West. Um, unfortunately, there was very little tracking of what happened to the children afterwards and whether the families that they were sent to live with actually took good care of them or not. A lot of personal accounts um, after the fact indicate that they were not well taken care of um, and experienced a lot of abuse at the hands of um, their adoptive families. American Indian children, on the other hand, had a very different reality. They were purposefully taken from their communities, whether or not their parents were poor, and put in residential schools or boarding schools where they were forbidden from speaking their um, native languages. They were forbidden from wearing their native clothes or practicing any of their cultural rituals. And the intention was quite literally to beat the Indian out of the child. A lot of children died at these schools from illness, neglect, lack of food, and from the abuse. 
And now you can see in the news, both in Canada and the United States, they're uncovering hundreds of unmarked graves, graves every month um, at these former school sites. So here is an example of one individual uh, before and after the whitewashing that was forced upon them at these residential schools. Here's another group and what they went through. And we are talking um, hundreds of thousands of children going through these school systems between the 1800s and the mid 1900s. So over 100 years of children being separated from their families and their tribes and uh, basically forced to follow customs uh, and religions that were not theirs. Most of these schools were run by the Catholic Church, uh, some Protestant and Baptist churches as well. And you can imagine the horrors that went on there. The 1900s were also the start of the eugenics movement. So early psychologists and social workers within the U.S. were trying to figure out why were some children um, not following social norms compared to others. And the eugenics movement decided that it was all down to their genes and that there were just some undesirable qualities being passed down from family to family. You know, as opposed to looking at the fact that these children were growing up in poverty with no education. No, it was their genes that was the problem. And unfortunately, this mindset continued um, for over 40 years up until the Second World War. So these uh, children were treated quite poorly as a result of this perceived um, innate delinquency that they had and were sometimes um, involuntarily imprisoned in mental asylums um, where they were forcefully sterilized and that practice actually continued right until the 1970s. People with mental health issues or disabilities in the United States were forcefully sterilized by um, these organizations with state sanction um, right up until the 1970s. And here is the psychologist and how he refers to a child. So Maria, who's only 12 and a half, um, he describes her in sexual terms. And then he notes that she was found to be dull by reason of excessive sex practices. So he's accusing a 12 year old of engaging in excessive sex practices instead of the adults who were abusing her. It was um, a very uh, victim blaming mentality that continued for many years and social workers in the United States were unfortunately very much a part of that system. They worked in the asylums, the children's centers where these uh, kids were. More recently, we can see that children continue to um, receive disparate treatment. ADHD diagnoses in the U.S. have grown exponentially uh, in recent years to 6.4 million in 2013. The production of Ritalin has increased by 450% and the U.S. consumes about 85% of the world's Ritalin supply. It's estimated that about 20% of all American boys will be diagnosed with ADHD by high school. So we continue to use um, a medical model in the treatment of children as opposed to looking at them more holistically and looking at the structural barriers that they encounter. And a lot of this goes to um, how the United States has dealt with the issue of human rights. So you might be familiar with things like the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights that was adopted in 1948. But what you might not be as familiar with is that even though Eleanor Roosevelt did her best to try and get this passed in the United States, there was a lot of pushback internally um, against the declaration and uh, the U.S. fought very hard to water down the language in it and they continued to do that with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and all the others that followed. 
Now, what's important to note as well is that while the U.S. did technically sign both of those, they have still not signed the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Sorry, they haven't ratified it. They signed it, but they haven't ratified it, which means it's still not legally enforceable within the United States. Same with the International Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. The U.S. is one of only five countries in the world that has not signed and ratified um, this convention. The um, Within the U.S., human rights are not determined, um, unfortunately, through this perspective. Uh, they are determined through um, the American Declaration of Independence, uh, which is amended through their amendments, um, not by legislation so much, but by the courts. So it's actually the Supreme Court of the United States that is able to determine the scope of human rights. So they're the ones that... Um, were able to establish things like the right to marriage for same-sex couples or um, the right to an abortion, not legislature. Uh, so that's why the Supreme Court in the United States is such a big deal and why there's always so much um, pushback from the various political parties when one of them uh, nominates a Supreme Court judge. And those Supreme Court judges are on that court uh, until they die or willingly resign. So that's a very long time that um, this small group of people determines the human rights of the rest of the country. It is not a great system by any means. But it all comes down to what are known as American values, right? Chasing the American dream. It's all about personal control and the view that change is good, as long as you know it's not changed towards a more uh, liberal social welfare state. Um, it's all about equality, not equity, equality. Everyone is equal. Everybody has equal opportunities. That's not really true, but that's what the value is and that's what they believe. There's a very strong case for individualism and that you're able to help yourself. If you're not able to help yourself, then that's your problem. Um, there's a lot of competition and free enterprise as a result of that. And it's a lot of work orientation. If you don't work or are not employed, then you are looked down upon because you're not meeting these values. And a lot of these values also center on materialism and acquisitiveness. So capitalism is very much alive and well in the U.S. And if we go through these values, in red, I've highlighted the ones that are very much associated with neoliberalism and that free market capitalism. And you can see that it is a lot of them. Most American values are grounded within this approach, and this impacts um, things like the very strong resistance that uh, the U.S. has encountered in making um, things like universal health care happen. That's in there just for fun. All right. So the U.S. context also very much impacts how social work happens within the U.S. The National Association of Social Worker Code of Ethics guides the social worker values. And you can see here that the top um, six values within this code of ethics, competency, dignity and worth of the person, importance of human relationships, integrity, service and social justice, only two of them are about others. Everything else is about the individual. So that individualistic focus continues and is replicated within the social work values um, and how social work is practiced within the United States. And that then impacts how social issues are responded to. Um, so now I will just cover quickly some social issues and how social workers unfortunately have um, neglected to respond uh, well to them. For one thing, um, the U.S. has a huge homelessness population, um, approximately 643,000 on any given night. Most of these are in families 
almost 20% are chronically homeless, 13% are fleeing domestic violence, and 12% are veterans. And though it's partially covered by my video here, you can see an example of what's known as hostile architecture. So in the United States, um, there's a very active movement to prevent the homeless from being in public spaces. So they implement things like these bars on the benches so they can't lie down. The response to homelessness is not to decrease homelessness, it's to make it less visible to the public. I briefly mentioned this, but um, there is a very big incarceration problem in the United States, not just of men, but also of women. Um, the number of women in prison is increasing at nearly double the rate for men. And it's grown by about 800%. Um, there's more than 200,000 women in prison or jail right now and another 1 million on probation. Most of them are incarcerated for nonviolent crimes, usually due to drug laws. So in the United States, um, the 1970s uh, were the beginning of what was known as the war on drugs. Now, the war on drugs is really just a euphemism for the war on black and poor people. Um, they did things like make marijuana a class one drug. So class one drugs are the most serious drugs. Heroin is a class one drug. Cocaine is a class two drug. Um, so you can see that by making marijuana a drug that at the time was predominantly used within the immigrant um, communities within Harlem and um, other uh, neighborhoods in uh, New York City and Washington, a class one drug and imposing the strictest penalties on it, they were really just targeting uh, black people and trying to incarcerate as many of them as possible. And you can see that it was quite effective by looking at this graph. After the 1970s, when these laws and mandatory minimum sentencing was imposed, there was a huge increase in the number of people uh, being sent to prison. And I'm sure you won't be surprised to find out that the majority of people who were being sent to prison were black or American Indian. So um, Hispanic women are incarcerated at nearly twice the rate of white women and black women are incarcerated at four times the rate. And you can see that the same is true for um, black men. Even though they make up less than a quarter of the United States population, you can see they make up more than half of the prison population. And a lot of um, the women, especially who are in prison, are there with a history of domestic violence or sexual abuse, and more than 75% of them are mothers. So that's resulted in a lot of children losing their parents to this prison industrial complex uh, and ending up in uh, state care. The problem also continues in that there's fewer alternatives to prison for women than men. Um, and most of the women who are imprisoned for violent um, crime are imprisoned for uh, self-defense. Um, and unfortunately, it's been found that domestic violence victims actually had higher conviction rates and longer sentences than all others charged with homicide, including those with prior criminal records. And the highest conviction rate was for African-American women. There is this um, system within the United States where domestic violence victims are blamed for the violence they experience. Um, as I mentioned, 40 to 80 percent of them acted in self-defense. Um, here is one example. Marissa Alexander, a DV survivor and mother, was sentenced to 20 years in prison for firing a warning shot at her husband, a man who um, had admitted to violence against her and other women. So she didn't actually shoot him. She fired a warning shot at him in self-defense, and she was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The same thing um, can be seen at a state level. 67% of women sent to prison for killing someone close to them had been abused by that person. 93% of women in California um, 
had been abused by um, somebody, by their significant other, and 67% reported that they were attempting to protect themselves and their children um, when the assault against the partner occurred. These women also face a lot of discrimination when they leave prison. Um, there's laws that ban uh, individuals with a felony record from voting in federal and state elections. They're banned from government assistance programs like housing or welfare. Um, they're also banned from working in certain industries like nursing, childcare, and home health care, which is exactly um, where women tend to work. These are uh, very women-dominated professions. And this is all exacerbated by the fact that um, there's mandatory reporting laws that social workers have to follow in many states, where if a woman um, discloses that she's experiencing domestic violence, the social worker has to make a referral to Child Protection Services. Child Protection Services then might end up making a referral to the uh, police and the woman might get charged with failure to protect. Um, the failure to protect the laws were aimed um, to save children from issues like neglect, but what they've actually done is been used to punish domestic violence survivors from not leaving their partners um, sooner, even when they were unaware that the abuse um, against their children was happening. So they weren't actually committing the abuse, but they're getting charged for not knowing abuse against their child was happening. And while failure to protect laws are supposed to be gender neutral, um, they have almost exclusively been applied against women um, compared to men. And there's been several cases where women have been charged with higher sentences, um, up to 40 years for failing to protect their children, while the abuser was sentenced for only five to 10 years for actually murdering the child. Um, it's a very big problem within the United States right now. So in summary, there are some key events that you need to remember um, have impacted how social workers um, are viewed within the United States and that we must never uh, forget about to make sure we don't repeat our mistakes. In the beginning, we really blamed the poor for being poor and took their children away. Um, same with immigrant populations and Native American children. Social workers also facilitated the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II in internment camps. Um, we actively facilitated the displacement of people of color to make way for white neighborhoods in the guise of community organizing from the 1960s all the way to the current time. And we very much neglect the needs and oppressions faced by black Americans until the 1960s by allowing Jim Crow laws to uh, continue to exist. And some would argue that we continue to ignore um, their needs because the prison industrial complex continues to grow. Um, we tend to focus on the accomplishments of white social workers when we teach about social work as opposed to the contribution of black social workers. And we focused on the professionalization of social work and clinical social work to the extent that now advocacy and social justice work is um, very rare within US social work practice. And lastly, we continue to contribute to the prison industrial complex through the school to prison pipeline and the criminalization of IPV victimization. So I know this covered a lot, but now at least you have a brief um, history and understanding of the context of social work in the United States.